Good morning and welcome. This is the week that Christmas finally arrives. So let's go ahead and stand and let's sing about the birthday of a king. Let's stand and sing. celebrate Jesus in our life every day because there's nothing more important or more worthy to be celebrated than the gift of Jesus and that is why we're here today to worship you Lord for you are worthy of our worship you love us you take care of us you provide for us you meet our needs and we thank you for this father I thank you Lord for the technology that allows us to speak to people in their homes right now and throughout the week as they watch on TV or on the internet. Lord, we thank you for this blessing. We pray that it will be used to build your kingdom, to touch and change lives. We thank you, Lord, for these that are here today. Lord, thank you. I pray that you will strengthen them, that you will inspire them, 
that you will grow us all, Lord, into who you created us to be. We thank you so much, Father, and we pray your, praise you, and we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. Oh, 
the wonderful thing about Jesus is it's not limited to just those of us who are faithful who can come to him. Those of us who are unfaithful can also come to him. And as he cleans us and saves us, he can then make us into the faithful followers of Jesus we're designed to be. Christmas season. We've been talking about 
how God's invitation to everyone, even those of us who are unfaithful, is available to all of us. Just because we're unfaithful does not make us uninvitable to God. Even at our best, greatest, and most faithful, we are unworthy to come to Jesus. But he says, that's fine. I died and shed my blood to forgive your sins so that you could be made worthy and made righteous. And so we can come into the presence of our Lord. He says, come see what God has done. No one is left out or excluded. The two songs that we sang there at the end, O come all ye faithful, and O come all ye unfaithful, really go hand in hand. They express our journey. Every person can and is invited to come to Jesus, even when you're unfaithful. And then come and stay with him when you are faithful, when he helps make you faithful. Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. And you who abide in me, who stay with me, I will stay with him. I will abide with him. And together we will bear much fruit. So Jesus says, come. Come and stay. In Revelation 3, he says, I stand at the door and knock. Anyone who opens the door, I will come in and abide with him. That means to dwell, to live, to stay. I will come and stay with you if you will but invite me in. Because you see, Jesus never forces his way in anywhere. He waits to be invited. So will you invite him? That's what we're here to talk about. The past, <clears throat> excuse me, the past three weeks we've seen how Jesus is still and always is faithful. Sin and rebellion on our part demonstrate our unfaithfulness to him. But that is not the end of the story. I'm so thankful for that. If that were the end of the story, none of us need be here because we're all lost and condemned to an eternity in hell and nothing can change that. But that's not the end of the story. We are invited. We are forgiven. We are loved. We are given grace. We are given mercy. We are given second chances, third chances, 797,340 second chances, and on and on and on. Just like a parent will often look at their child and say, I don't like what you've done, but I love you. And nothing you can ever do can make me stop loving you. I will not like what you do, but I will always love you. And that is how God looks at us. And that is how he speaks to us. And he sent Jesus to prove that fact for us. When we sin, we're unfaithful. Sin and rebellion demonstrate our unfaithfulness. But this message of hope that begins at Christmas in the manger that we see portrayed here, it begins here. Today we're looking at the ultimate in God's faithfulness as defined in 1 John verse, chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We looked last week mm. at a verse that said, if we are unfaithful, and I said that really should be translated when we are unfaithful, because we're going to be. The author used the word if to give us the, ben <clears throat> excuse me, the benefit of the doubt. But we're going to be unfaithful. Each of us is unfaithful. All of us have sinned. Paul said that specifically in Romans 3.23. He said, all of us 
have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned. Now, in that verse where he says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, the phrase there, glory of God, that's something that maybe we don't quite understand because it's kind of hard to pin down. But if we look at the Old Testament use of that term, every time the phrase glory of God is used, it refers literally to the presence of God. When Moses dedicated the tabernacle, it says the glory of God came and filled the tabernacle to such a capacity that Moses and none of the priests could enter in. The presence of God was there. The same thing happened when Solomon dedicated the temple. The glory of God filled the place. The glory of God is, always refers to the presence of God. So each of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because of our sin, we cannot get to the presence of God. We are separated from Him because of our sin. And only because of our sin. So all of us have sinned. We are separated from God. We cannot be in the presence of God because each of us have sinned. John tells us there in 1 John, he goes on and he says that the greatest sin we commit is against ourselves, and that is the sin of deception. The sin of deception. He says this in 1 John 1, 8, convincing ourselves that we don't sin. The verse right before the one that we read. He says, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. And then he goes on and says, for if we will confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That's the way those two verses fit together. If we say we have no sin, if we say we've never done anything wrong, we are deceiving ourselves. I haven't met very many in my lifetime, but I've met, I, can, I think I can remember two people mm. that I have talked to about sin, and they said, I've never sinned. I've never done anything wrong. I've never broken any rules or commands. I've never done anything wrong. And boy, it was really hard to talk to them because they just, they don't, if you've never sinned, you don't need God. Because you're perfect just like Jesus. And it's hard to talk to people when they have that kind of an attitude. They have deceived themselves so entirely. Mm -hmm. Satan's greatest accomplishment is conv convincing the world that he doesn't exist. And that sin doesn't exist. Because you look at it today, we talk here in the church about sin. You go out in the world and people will tell you that that's wrong. Because an arbitrary list written 2,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago, whenever, has no bearing on life today in this modern day and age that we live in. And the things that the Bible says are wrong, that's completely outdated and outmoded and it doesn't count anymore. They're wrong. The things that were wrong to do 5,000 years ago are wrong to do today. Amen. Just because a lot of people want to do it and say it's okay doesn't make it, make it okay. Because God is the creator of everything. And as the creator, he is the owner. And as the owner, he gets to set the rules. We can say we don't like the rules. But that does not invalidate the rules. We're sitting here today. You folks are. I'm up here. Wearing masks. Nobody that I know of enjoys wearing 
your masks. But why do we do it? Well, for two reasons. One, it's the rules. It's the law in our state. And while some people are trying to make it a religious issue, I don't see anywhere in the Bible where it says don't wear a mask for public health reasons. And two, they do, in some forms and fashion, some ways, small ways, protect us from this COVID pandemic. And I've said this before, because of my religion, because of my faith in Jesus, I'm willing to wear a mask if it means somebody else can be safe. I'm willing to make that sacrifice. I don't like it. I don't enjoy it. But I'm willing to make that sacrifice for someone else's best interest. And that's what the Bible says we're supposed to do. And I have real issues with pastors and churches and teachers that are saying the opposite stuff. I have real problems with them. Because I want to see in the scriptures how they justify and what it really comes down to is it's not an issue of religion. It's not an issue of faith. It's an issue of politics. And we have a humanitarian crisis in our community and in our world today, in our country. Because of this pandemic, we do not have a political crisis. Well, we have a political crisis. But COVID is not a political crisis. It's a humanitarian crisis. If we deal with it as a humanitarian issue, we will solve it, and there will be much less issue, much less fighting, much less arguing, much less hatred. If we want to keep it a political issue, we'll never get past it. Sorry, I'll step off my soapbox. But this all ties in to Satan. He's convinced people that he's not real, that he doesn't exist. That's his greatest accomplishment. And a survey that I saw that I think George Barna did several years ago, about 72% of people believed that there was a heaven. They said, yeah, there's a heaven of some sort. They don't know what it is. They don't necessarily buy the biblical description of heaven, but they'll believe there's something out there. But it was only about 48% believed in the existence of a hell. Well, if you don't believe that hell exists, you're certainly not going to live your life in a way to avoid it. Because why would you want to avoid something that doesn't exist, something that's not real? And then, many of those that do believe that hell may exist, it is going to be for the child molesters and the serial murderers and... You know, these types of horrible, nasty people, it's not going to be for your average, everyday sinner. And those people are in for such a rude awakening at the judgment. And then it is way too late. But when we are convinced that Satan is not real, despite all the evidence in the world around us, When we are convinced that sin is not real, that I get to decide what's right and what's wrong for my life and nobody else can tell me what's right and what's wrong, and as long as I do what I think is right, then there is no sin, we're doing nothing but deceiving ourselves. And we can do nothing worse to ourselves than deceive ourselves, especially where sin and God is concerned. All have sinned. When we sin. If we will confess. This is how verse 9 begins. If we will confess. Jesus made confession. And repentance. A requirement for forgiveness. Jesus did not die on the cross. Pay the price for all of our sins. And say okay. Okay. That's it. They're all taken care of. Everybody's cool. Everybody's clean. Everybody gets to heaven. He died on the cross. He paid the price for our sins. 
so that every sin can be forgiven, the one caveat is we have to ask for forgiveness. We have to admit that we're sinners. For years and years and years, our Bible school had the way of salvation laid out as the ABCs. We had to admit that we were sinners. We had to be believe that Jesus is God's son and he died on the cross for us. And then we had to see, confess our faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Jesus made confession a requirement for forgiveness. And why did he do that? Couldn't he have just paid the price and said, okay, everybody's fine? Yes. But why didn't he do that? Well, because confession <clears throat> begins with us. Confession begins with, actually it begins with God and his work. But it begins with us when we realize we have sinned against God when we have rebelled against God, when we realize that we have broken the laws of God, then we have to say, I'm sorry. We have to confess it. Just like a child going to their parents. Usually not necessarily on their own. It's usually after they've been caught. You know, the child stays out after curfew, comes in at 1 in the morning instead of 11, and mom and dad are still sitting up waiting for them as they sneak into the house. One of the first things they'll usually say is, I'm sorry, I was out late. I know I shouldn't have been. But, and then they'll try to justify their sin. That's what we do. We try to justify don't look like you're better off than your teenagers. Think back to when you were a teenager. You did it too. I did it too. Confession begins with us. We have to realize our sin. We have to realize we've broken the rules. And then the other thing is, the other reason is confession requires humility. Confession requires humility. And we people, we humans, are very proud and very arrogant, and very conceited, and very condescending, and we don't like to be humble. We don't like to humble ourselves. We do not like to be humiliated. Confession requires humility. Many of us are familiar with the verse from 2 Chronicles 7.14, it speaks about an entire nation, but it applies to each person individually. Mm -hmm. That verse says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. I've heard so many people praying this verse, especially the last part, that God would heal our land. Mm -hmm. We seem to forget the first part. We need to do the we need to start with humbling ourselves and praying and seeking the face of God and turning from our wicked ways. Then God will do his part. And we're asking God to do his part before we've done our part. That's not how this works. This is a cause and effect. This is an if-then clause. If we do this, then this is what will happen. If we don't do this, this doesn't happen. If we do not humble ourselves, if we do not confess our sins, we cannot receive forgiveness. Mm. Jesus did the work and offers it to us. Mm. The initial cost is confession and humility. We don't like to admit that we've done something wrong. Think about it at your job. When was the last time you messed up and you immediately went to your boss and said, hey, I oops. No, you did you try to hide it? Did you try to cover it up? Did you try to fix it so that somebody else would get blamed for it? 
That's what we want to do. That's our normal reaction. Anything but confessing and humbling ourselves. And you see, one thing about humility, humbling yourselves, is you have to admit that someone outranks you for you to admit to them, to humble yourself. And we don't like to admit that anybody outranks us, even God. That's why the biggest industry in our world today is making humans into gods. Everybody wants to be God. Everybody wants to be their own God, and they try to offer different ways that we can become gods. And it doesn't work. Because all these ways are empty and useless, and they fall short. There are entire religious cults out there that will say, if you will just follow all the rules, then when you die, you will become a god. And your soul will be elevated. And you will become a god. And not only will you become a god, <clears throat> but somewhere out there in space, is a planet that you will become the God of. You know, big money is poured into that cult every week. And if you ask most of the people that attend that cult, and they say, you ask them, have you picked your planet that you want to be a god of when you die? They'll look at you like you've got three heads. They have no clue what you're talking about. Because that's not a teaching they publicize very much for the lay people. Because they know how nuts it sounds. And they know that that's not found anywhere in the Bible. Which is one of many holy books that they have. If we confess... And we're back to an if-then clause. If we confess, then God is always faithful. And that's what that verse 9 says. If we confess, God is always faithful. He's faithful to forgive us. He's faithful to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. No one is left out. I don't care how bad you've been. I don't care what horrible things you've done in your life. If you will confess them and humble yourself to God, you will be forgiven. Period. No one is left out. You can be sitting there going, Pastor, preacher, you have no idea the things I've done in my life. You're right. I have no idea. But none of it catches God by surprise. He knows everything you've done. And he loves you just the same. And he says, come to me, you unfaithful one, and I will make you into a faithful one. No one is left out. God will forgive anyone, anything, if you will confess and humble yourself. Why the humility is necessary is because we humans so often want and demand to do things ourselves. If you don't believe me, if you don't believe that's our natural, to use com computer language, default setting, look at your average two, three, four-year-old. They're very independent. They demand to do everything their way. You can explain to them 37,000 times that you cannot put both arms in one arm of a shirt and have it go on right, and it doesn't matter to them. They want to get both arms in one sleeve, period. And they're determined that that's how they're going to wear that shirt. And of course, they never do because you can't do that. But we're determined that we're going to do everything ourselves. We are very independent. And that's because God created us to be independent. But he also created us to be dependent upon one another and dependent upon him. And when we refuse 
to do part of what, how we were created, that leads to conflict inside, outside, everywhere. So we have to admit that we can't do something about our sin. We have to admit that only God could do something about our sin. And that's hard. That's hard for us to do. That's hard for a lot of people to do. I've said so many times I could get more people saved if I could get them lost first. But they won't admit that they're lost. They won't admit that they've sinned. They won't admit that they're far from God. They won't admit that they need God. We have to confess that we've sinned and admit that only God can fix it before we can receive the forgiveness that God freely offers. The great pastor and scholar, John Stott, I love his writings. I love John Stott's writings. He's a great, great writer. He said this, the proper Christian attitude to sin is not to deny it, but to admit it, and then to receive the forgiveness which God has made possible and promises to us. If we confess our sins, acknowledging before God that we are sinners, not only by nature, but by practice, God will both forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. In the first phrase, sin is a debt which he remits, and in the second, a stain which he removes. That's very well said. If we admit our sin, he is faithful to forgive us of our sin. Forgiving the sin debt that we have and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Removing the stain that sin puts in our lives. The promise to forgive is the fulfillment of the promise made by God in the covenant announced by Jeremiah in Jeremiah 31, 34. This is when God, through Jeremiah, is announcing the coming of Jesus. This is messianic. It is the promise of a new covenant. And he says, And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive your, their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. And this is the promise fulfilled in Jesus. Are you ready to humble yourself and confess your sins? Through the work of Jesus on the cross, God is waiting to forgive your sins. His promise is to forgive your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Do you want to be cleansed? Do you want to have that stain removed? If you believe that you're too stained, too filthy for God, I've got news for you. You're wrong. He's got the perfect cleanser. He can clean you if you'll just let him. It says in the Psalms, taste and see that the Lord is good. Give it a try. Taste him. Allow him to work in your life. I've heard it said, try God. If you don't like the results, Satan will take you back. Believe me. Once you really and truly know who God is, once you have that true personal fellowship and relationship with Jesus, you'll never want anything else. He can cleanse you. He can forgive you. He wants to. There is no greater desire in the heart of God right now than to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you of any and all unrighteousness in your life. Do you want to move from unfaithful to faithful? God is waiting for you. Jesus was born specifically to die for your sins. Will you come to him? He's waiting for you. If you're ready to humble yourself, 
if you're ready to confess your sins, then I want to tell you how to do it. All you got to do is tell God. And I'll help you with that. Because I know, especially for the first time, talking to God can seem very intimidating. But he's got a very waiting ear, open arms, and an open heart ready for you. And so if you're ready to confess your sins, if you're ready to be cleansed of all unrighteousness, all you need to do is confess, to humble yourself and pray. And let me help you with that. I'll pray a prayer. And if you want to do this in your life right now, just pray this prayer with me. Just repeat what I say. So let's pray. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I have broken your rules. I have broken your commands. Please forgive me, God. Please cleanse me of my unrighteousness. I am sorry for my sin. Come into my heart. Clean me. And help me live for you for the rest of my life. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I need to know it. If you're here this morning and you prayed that prayer, get the communication card <clears throat> out of the pew in front of you. Put your name and contact information on it because I've got to be able to contact you. And on the back side in the blank, tell me I prayed that prayer. There's also a box back there that says something about further questions. If you have questions about becoming a follower of Jesus or baptism or anything that we do in this church, mark that, write it down, ask me, and I will get with you this week so that you can start this Christmas as a fully devoted follower of Jesus for the first time and for the rest of your life. If you're watching on Facebook and you prayed that prayer with me, please drop a comment. Just right under there in the comments, say, I prayed that prayer and I'll get back with you. If you don't want to make that public, that's okay. Send a personal message to the church and I will get back with you probably no later than tomorrow because I'm so excited and I want to help you take the next steps as you grow in this. If you're watching on Comcast, if you're sitting at home and you prayed that prayer, call me, email me. The number, the email address is at the end of the service in the credits. It'll be right there. We may even be able to put it right above this spot where I'm talking. You might be able to see it on the screen right now. Send me an email. Give me a call. Leave a message here at the church. And I will get with you this week. I will get back to you. Because this is the greatest thing you could ever do. And I want to be here to help you take the next step. Because this is not the end of a journey. It's the beginning of a wonderful journey. For those of us who are already followers of Jesus, those of us who know him, we know, we admit, we can be unfaithful. Sometimes... We can be faithful quite often. And we need to pray. And we need to ask for forgiveness. And we need to be asked to be cleansed. Not because we lose our salvation. We can't lose our salvation. But because our sin separates us from God. And we want that relationship restored. And so let's take a moment. And let's pray. I want to invite everyone here. Everyone watching. Bow your head. Close your eyes. And ask Jesus to forgive you of the sins that you have committed. To restore the relationship that you need with him. The fellowship. So that the, your sin no longer separates you from God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, forgive me. Forgive me of my sins, Lord, of which you know them all. You probably know some that I don't even know. Forgive me. Cleanse me from my unrighteousness. Help me to be pure in your sight. Lord, remove the sin that is a barrier between you and I so that I can know the full fellowship and the full blessing 
of walking hand in hand with my Lord and Savior and Creator. And do that for each person here, Lord. Remind us of our sins, whether they were committed this morning, last month, or five years ago or more. Forgive us. Cleanse us. When we are unfaithful, Lord, I thank you that you are faithful and that your love for us knows no end. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much.
like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Leon, can I get you to dis dismiss us in prayer, please? Dear Lord, our God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for what you do in our life. We praise you in all things. We just ask that you go with us as we leave here and keep us safe. Bring us back again, Lord.